Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. David Moore Robinson lives in Alexandria, Virginia, with his wife and their two vociferous but well-meaning Jack Russell Terriers. Most mornings, he can be sl- he can be found sliding backward on his rear end, rowing up and down the Potomac with his teammates. David holds a bachelor's in English from the University of Notre Dame, a master's in teaching from the Columbia Teachers College, and master of fine arts in creative writing from Colorado State University. David is the author of My Unremarkable Brain, a fat-fueled adventure into the world of epilepsy and the ketogenic diet, a hilarious and inspiring book where David, a serial dieter and middle-aged fat fleet, <laughs> takes readers on a ride into the strange and surprising world of American health culture. At the age of 40, after living for over a decade with epilepsy, David decided to put his brain to the task of figuring out the best way to eat and live. What he discovered was a community of medical experts, thought leaders, and regular folks gathered around the ketogenic diet, a much reviled fad diet that is in fact a proven 100 year old medical treatment for epilepsy and other brain disorders. You can find David on Instagram at D Robinson writes. David Robinson, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Boundless Body Radio. The honor's all mine, my friend. Thank you for having me, Casey. I appreciate it. It's such an honor to host you. Um, like I said, I'm really glad I got the right introduction. I was almost prepared to talk about your career with the San Antonio Spurs, your two Olympic appearances, <laughs> the original Dream Team, a few championships. You are, in fact, not seven foot one, and you have not played pro basketball. So get that out of the way. That's correct. That's correct. I'm a mere six foot four, you know, <laughs> That's pretty shrimpy close. little guy, you know. <laughs> That's pretty close. Oh, man. Although, although I met him once and his chin is right about my forehead. I have a picture of us standing next to each other and it's just incredible. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I love that. My dad does uh, My dad does sports here in the Salt Lake Valley. And so he's been able to talk with a lot of those guys. And so it's funny to watch him like try to interview some of these centers. And he's as tall as I am, like 5'8". <laughs> and so he'd pretty much have a short, sore shoulder interviewing a lot of these people. <laughs> Oh, oh my God, that's hilarious. <laughs> um, I love the way you approached writing your book. I really enjoyed reading. Um, I'm, I'm through a few chapters. I really enjoyed kind of reading it and the way you approached it. You talk in the very beginning about what this book is not, which I actually really appreciated that part as well. Um, but can you explain to the reader in what scenario would possibly exist that being told that you have an unremarkable brain is actually a very, very good thing? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's where I got the title. Um, and I said, there's a story behind that. So, so, um, at this point I had been living with epilepsy for a while and, um, had a, had a long time seizure free, but, uh, you know, had a couple of seizures and the doctor sent me for an MRI. Um, in fact, I had to ask for the MRI. That's a whole other story, but he said, ah, oh, you're fine. And I said, mm, you sure, you know, um, and a friend, a friend of mine who's a neurologist is sort of pushed me a little bit. I didn't know at the time that my friend was worried that I might have a brain tumor, um, which if I had known that, I, I would have pushed a little bit harder, probably. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so I went got the MRI. And um, uh, the the radiologist is like, you know, I said to the radiologist, okay, you see anything? He's like, well, your doctor will call you with the results, right? Um, and this was, in fairness, it was like the Friday before Christmas or something like that. It was kind of a weird time of year, you know? Um, but I'm sitting there waiting to hear, waiting to hear, you know, kind of, uh, you know, I wonder what's going on with that. And then a week or so later, I, I never did hear from my doctor, by the way. This is the same one who said, don't worry about it, you know, um, <laughs> who I eventually moved on from. Thank you. Um, but uh, but uh, uh, finally, I got something in the mail and it was the actual report from the MRI. And I'm looking at it. I don't, I can't read this thing. You know, it's a bunch of letters and numbers and words that I don't understand and left hemisphere, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the very bottom was a, a diagnosis and unremarkable brain. <laughs> I said, yeah, it sounds, you know, I think my high school teachers would, would be on board with that, you know, with that description. Um, <laughs> not exactly the straight A student, but, um, but what it really means is that there's nothing to be remarked on, right? There's no, there's no lesions or, tumors or, or anything negative going on. So it's one of those funny upside down, you know, medical terms, you know, where the test comes out negative, it's actually a good thing, right? That, right. you know, there's there's nothing to be found there. But, um, but, you know, the reason I titled my book after that was that it was kind of a moment for me where there's almost something empowering about having that information in my hands and knowing something about what's going on. And it kind of, um, it, it's sort of uh, uh, symbolic or, of, this whole journey that I've been on of learning about diet and learning about how diet can affect health and how, you know, um, how specifically my diet can actually affect my brain health. You know, it's something that 
never even would have occurred to me, you know, uh, before. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of why I why I included it. It's not, it is a funny story, but it's also, you know, sort of this this um, um, emblematic uh, uh, moment in, in the journey that I've been on. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's a great title. <laughs> it's a really great title. Like I said, if somebody just stopped you on the side of the street and said, hey, you've got an unremarkable brain, be like, uh, thanks. But um, in that context, <laughs> very, very helpful. Exactly. Uh, that's awesome. OK, so let's go back and tell the full story. Um, I appreciate kind of skipping ahead uh, to that. I thought that was really funny. Um, but yeah, so so our mutual friend uh, Maggie Stewart recommended that we get you on the show. And when she recommends somebody, we don't need to vet them out at all. I'm automatically just right, you know, with their email, just gonna reach out as soon as possible. So listening to you on her uh, podcast, Off the Couch, was really great. Um, but let's hear your story into health. This wasn't uh, something you were seeking out, and your diagnosis of epilepsy was actually kind of interesting, much later than I would have guessed. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, so yeah, and and the book, and thanks for the the compliments on the book because it's it's kind of a it's a weird little book, right? It has these sort of different strands. You know, I didn't find a ketogenic diet for epilepsy. Actually, I was looking for a weight loss diet, right? right? And uh, as I tell you know, my so my first section is sort of about that journey. I call it fat on the body, right? And um, how I sort of you know had uh, I was an athlete in college. I was a, a rower. And, um, you know, I was on the rowing team and everything. And um, so I was in really good shape and, and all that sort of thing. But time goes by, right? And by the time I was uh, 39, um, I had, you know, I had developed a bit of a belly. You know, I, I put on a little more, uh, I was carrying uh, quite a lot of weight, actually, um, probably about 50 pounds overweight. Um, and I actually discovered a local rowing club, master's rowing club for people of my age and got back into that. And that was kind of fun, but I was also looking for, you know, how should I eat? So I tried, you know, I tried Weight Watchers, the typical story, right? I tried Weight Watchers. I tried, um, you know, this diet, that diet. And I was always sort of in the neighborhood of low carb, but I was always skeptical about low carb diets because I thought, well, of course, if you cut out a third of food, it's just, you're just cutting calories, right? It's just another way of cutting calories. Um, <clears throat> And so I was, you know, I was trying like clean eating, uh, uh, the wild diet, Abel James, you know, so all, all these sort of low carb adjacent things, right? Um, and then one day I was listening to a podcast and um, and that's the other thing. At, at the same time, I had taken a job. Um, I had gone from teaching in front of the classroom to a, a more of an administrative, more of a desk job. And I had a longer commute. So I discovered podcasts and started getting into, hmm, let me listen to this person, listen to that person. Uh, and so anyway, one day I was listening to... Um, the model health show. Um, I don't know if you know that one, but uh, the, the guest Stevens. Yeah. Sean Stevenson. Sean Stevenson. That's Stevenson. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's a great, really great show too. Uh, and I heard uh, Vinny Tortorich. I don't know if you've had Vinny on the show, but he's um, a funny guy and an engaging guy. And I thought and he talked about NSNG, like no sugars, no grains. Thought, well, that's pretty interesting. You know, that seems doable versus you know this whole whole big thing um little did i realize at the time that that's about 80 percent of the food in the supermarket has some kind of sugars or some kind of grains you know um <clears throat> so i started kind of listening a little bit you know kind of interested and then um what really convinced me was that he would have um what he called the luminaries he had gary tabs on there so i listened to oh wow so much interesting stuff to say so i'd run off and read Gary Taubes' book, you know, and then a few weeks later, he'd have Nina Teicholtz and I read her book and, you know, just so many uh, great thinkers. And, and it just, you know, it, it it starts to build up like you, you can't unsee it, right? Once you start to kind of understand how much sense it makes, right? Um, so I, st I was in the phase of starting to get into the low carb diet and starting to see some success with it and drop a few pounds, you know, um, I would say it was sort of um, dabbling, you know, maybe on again, off again, right? Uh, a little bit. But um, but there was one day that he had Jim Abrams on as a guest. I don't know if you're familiar with Jim Abrams, um, but he's a Hollywood, big time Hollywood producer. He made the airplane movies, you know, the um, really hilarious and, and really dopey movies from my childhood. You so know. Good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and um, so he was a guest and he was talking about his son, Charlie, who, um, when Charlie was uh, a year and a half old, he started having seizures and um, he went through, they went through every possible uh, therapy known to man. They went through every medication they went through. He had an operation on his brain. Um, they were getting ready to do a second operation on his brain, which would basically um, 
as Jim said, you know, it would have led to what they call quote unquote progressive retardation throughout the rest of his life, right? Um, I mean, basically would have made him a vegetable, right? Eventually. And so um, Jim was starting to look, uh, Jim was in at uh, one night, he says, he was in the library of the UCLA Medical Center and he was looking up, um, you know, he's looking up epilepsy and, and this and going through the the um what do you call the the index and he sees a reference to ketogenic diet what the heck is that so he starts looking it up and sees that there's this diet that they can use for epilepsy brings it up to the doctor and the doctor says yeah we don't really do that anymore you know um <clears throat> why not you know so rather than go through this operation he f- seeks out and finds a guy named dr john freeman who's at the time the only medical practitioner in the country who still administers the ketogenic diet for epilepsy. Wow. Um, now, again, he's a very wealthy Hollywood producer, so he has access to, and then the means to be able to fly across the country, you know, to Baltimore and take his kid to the doctor. And uh, he said, sure enough, within within weeks, he was going from uh, dozens of seizures a day down to none completely, right? Um, and after three years, after two years on the diet, they tried weaning him off and started having seizures again. So they did another two years, weaned him off, and he had basically outgrown the epilepsy. It was he was gone. And Charlie's an adult today. He actually, um, you know, he, he's a school teacher himself. You know, and and he does videos online, and he's part of this foundation, which Jim began. So as soon as he said nobody should have to go through this experience that I did, and so he and his wife Nancy started this. Charlie, uh, the Charlie Foundation, named after his son, and um, and so they, you know, they have been actually the driving force in the ketogenic diet for epilepsy ever since the early '90s when they formed that. Um, so anyway, so uh, so I heard all uh, from my st- from my standpoint, I heard this and it was just like, wow, you know, this is incredible. And the first time I had ever thought that you know what I eat might affect what's going on in my brain, you know. Um, to quote Georgia Ede, she says, you know, believe it or not, science shows that the brain is part of the body, right? And it's confirmed. We have confirmed that. <laughs> we, we have now confirmed that, yes. Um, and so I was like, wow, that's really interesting, you know. But again, so so at this, by this time, I had my medication pretty well tuned in, right? I had been about 10 years seizure-free. I wake up in the morning, take a pill, take one at night again, you know, kind of not think about it, you know. Um, and so I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, interesting. I could look into this, but why why rock the boat kind of thing, you know? Um, kind of just tucked it in the back of my mind, I guess. Um and and then it was a few it was a few months after that that um I was I had gone on a trip, I had gone camping um with my brother up in upstate New York. And was driving back here to Alexandria, where I live, and it's a good eight-hour drive. So, so a pretty intense weekend. You know, get up there. We're, you know, sleeping rough. We're, we're, you know, having a couple of beers. You know, do you know whatever. Um, and um, about halfway through the trip, and somewhere in Pennsylvania, I started to have what they call an aura. Now, for me, um, for me, an aura, uh, everyone's different. Some people will see things or bright lights or you know, a headache or t- tingling. Uh, for me, it actually starts in the auditory center of my brain. And so I hear things, mm. basically, is the best way to put it. Um, my very first seizure was I heard, you know, I was having a conversation with some friends, and all of a sudden it sounded like you ever take like a, a cardboard tube and stick it on your ear, and it sounds like people are echoing at the end of a tunnel or something yeah. like that. Yeah. That's what it started sounding like to me. And I kind of felt like you know, tingly and, and floating a little bit. Um, this particular time I was driving. Again, I was driving my car and I had the radio on, but then I heard another song over top of it, like this musical tune. And I was like, where is wow, that coming from? And I turned off the radio and it's still going on. And I was like, oh my God, uh-oh. <laughs> and I'm again, I'm on a highway, right? And so I start to pull over to the side and that's the last thing I remember. Um, apparently the car had taken a left turn across two lanes of traffic, a big grassy median, two more lanes of traffic, and up an embankment right near a, oh actually goodness. right near an overpass. So um, it was a pretty close call. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a, so um, my wife was at home at the time, and she gets a call from, you know, is this the wife of David Robinson? She said, yeah, uh, your husband's been in an accident. 
just what happened? Is he okay? Well, he's been in an accident. You need to come to this hospital and come get him. Okay. Um, now, as it happens, my wife doesn't drive. So she calls up her best friends and says, Hey, can you guys go with me to this? And so they, they all hop in the car, pile in the car. It's Sunday afternoon, right? Um, they drive three hours up to come get me. And, um, uh, and uh, what they call the rescue mission, you know, um, good friends. And my, yeah, yeah, very good friends. Uh, two, two of my buddies from the rowing club. So you know, the, you make these bonds in life when when you get together and you do positive things, right? Um, and so uh, they call it they called it uh, uh, the road trip of a lifetime. You know, <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, my friend Rich likes to joke. He said, you know, you probably you started having a seizure. My dog Jake, this little Jack Russell, is in the back. You know, it's like, yeah, Jake probably jumped on your lap and he's trying to steer the car. You know. <laughs> wow. so you know you gotta have fun with the stuff but but that was the point obviously where i said okay now i'm really gonna look into this ketogenic diet thing you know and uh so that's when i managed to get myself enrolled at a patient as a patient at johns hopkins uh where they now have um they now have an not only a pediatric uh, uh epilepsy center which they've had for many many years but they also have a uh, adult ep epilepsy center as well and so uh, i got managed to get enrolled with patient there with uh, dr mackenzie Serbanka, who does all kinds of research in this field and um she's been terrific and so yeah it's been six years um six years ketogenic uh uh coming up on three years seizure free knock knock wood you know um and still, and I always like to qualify too. It's not, it, I love to say that it's this amazing before and after miraculous thing, but, but it's a journey, you know, um, and I'm still on medication as well, you know, but to me, it's, you know, if I can participate in my treatment, if I can have some power over what's going on in my body, then I want, then I want to do that. You know what I mean? Um, then that's, that's, it's meaningful to me. It's very well, it, like I said, empowering, just being able to, to say, oh, there's something I can do about this, you know what I mean, yeah. and not just receive treatment or or let it happen, kind of thing. Yeah. You know, it's it's such a different thing than the opposite of that, which is like you have to take this pill. That's like the opposite of empowering. It, <laughs> it's telling you you have to do exactly. something that is outside of your control versus doing something that is inside your control. What an amazing story, and crazy to think that. Um, she she you know, nearly died knowing how smart jack russell terriers are he probably did try to get up there and steer i wouldn't put that past <laughs> a jack russell terrier for sure um okay so so when was your original diagnosis of epilepsy and what was that like when that first kind of started you you mentioned you know we kind of think of keto as like this fad diet or you mentioned like with the abram story like they told him like oh we don't really do that anymore Th that, yeah. there is a bit of that in in the kind of medical world especially as it pertains to epilepsy but what things did they tell you when was the diagnosis like how, how did that go yeah great question so i was um, i had my first seizure at 28 years old um I had had before that I, I mentioned my auras and before that I had had one aura when I was at work, didn't realize what it was. I just thought, Oh, that's kind of, maybe I ate something, you know, maybe it's just weird headache. Right. Um, but, uh, this particular night I was, uh, I, at the time I was living in New York and, uh, in New York city and working as a New York city high school teacher. Um, so one of my roommates was a colleague, one of my fellow teachers and the other one was, well, he worked on wall street. So, um, so three guys living in this apartment and it's a typical, I think it was a Wednesday night. We were kind of sitting around talking about, oh, should we order out for dinner? You know, what are we going to do? Blah, blah, blah. And I, again, I sort of had that, like that lightheadedness, faintness, you know, um, the weird sort of auditory thing going on. And I stood up. I remember we had one of those. Do you remember the Papasan chairs? It was like a like a shaped like a satellite dish. No, <laughs> like, I should know about that. Here one oh, or something yes, like yes, that. Yes, 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 yes. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, these funky things. So it was one of those chairs. And I, I stood up to like try to clear my head, you know, try to shake my head or whatever. And that's when I lost consciousness. I fell back into the chair. So thankfully, nice soft landing. Um, and um, and started to have a full on, you know, and then my seizures are, are full on grand mal, you know, the, the shaking, the loss of consciousness, you know, eyes rolling back in my head, the whole scary thing, right? Um, that's one thing a lot of people don't know. There's 
dozens of types of seizures, you know, some people just lose consciousness, some people, um, the brain sort of seizes up, but nothing happens physically, they sort of have to stare out and what they call an absence seizure, you kind of stare out into the distance. Um, but yeah, mine was the the, the, the full production. And um, <clears throat> so my roommates were, you know, obviously freaked out, right, completely free. So one of them calls 911, they're kind of running around you know, screaming. And, and we had this room, um, we had this neighbor at the time and he was kind of a, a doofus, right? Um, we, behind his back, we called him the buffoon and, um, <laughs> and he comes tromping down the hallway. What's going on in here? <laughs> Make a buffoon go out and, and, and hail an ambulance. Like, <laughs> like they're driving around like taxis. Right. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so the, uh, so the EMTs show up, right. And, um, and they're doing sort of their their check and their all their things, right? And, it, and the thing is, after a seizure, typically there's what they call a post ictal period where you're you're back to being um, conscious, but you're kind of really out of it. You know what I mean? So people they think they get mistaken for being drunk or on drugs or something like that because you know they're kind of making not making any sense, right? Um, so they sit there and they ask you, you know, what's your name? Uh, what day? Do you know what day of the week it is? Do you know who's the president? The guy goes, uh, what did you have for breakfast? And I was like, um, yogurt. And my roommate's like shaking his head. He's like, he had a bagel and cream cheese. Come on. <laughs> so, so, so that was, that was my first experience. Right. Um, so I wound up, uh, they took me to the hospital and they ran every test known to man. They did the MRI, you know, they stick you in this big tube and have the, magnets banging around your head or whatever the eg where they put a bunch of electrodes on your head to, to check out your brain waves you know um and uh they didn't really find anything but uh i have a family history so my younger brother has had epilepsy um since he was a child right um he had absence seizures which i mentioned and then that during sort of his adolescence progressed into grand mal seizures as well um, and so they said, well, it does kind of run in families. It's not uncommon for two siblings uh, to have it, right? So they put me on medication, um, which I was like, okay, fine. You know, that's the procedure. Okay, sure. Um, didn't really question it. Um, one unusual thing happened, though, though they put me on um, a medication called, uh, I think it was, at the time I was on Dilantin. Um, and um, the, they said, okay, you're going to have uh, one of these pills three times. It, it was supposed to be 100 milligrams three times a day. Whoever wrote it down, these are the days of the prescription pad, you know, um, wrote down 300 milligrams three times a day. Oh, my goodness. So by the end of that week, I was completely out of it. Like, I couldn't stay awake all day. I was having these weird dreams of, like, rainbows and unicorns and things, like these <laughs> vivid, crazy dreams. So I went into uh, the usual neurologist, uh, uh, you know, not not hospital neurologist, you know, that they had recommended and went into her office and she's like, wait, you're on this. She's like, this seems like a lot. Like <laughs> so, three times as much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So she sent me and sure enough, I was like at toxic levels. Right. And so, you know, this is my first experience with the medical system with epilepsy. Nice. Right. So you can understand how I'm also kind of partial to a non-medical uh, a non-medicinal treatment to this whole thing. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, I was back in the hospital for another day doing the, the whole detox thing. Um, so it, it's, you know, again, I, I'm always open to exploring alternatives. Although, as I point out in the book, this is a hundred year old treatment. I, I don't even consider this to be alternative medicine, really, in some ways, you know. Yeah. Um, and um, and that story is really fascinating to me, too. So. Yeah, I mean, maybe we can talk about that. Um, I, I do want to ask when when you became, you know, diagnosed and medicated in the very beginning, um, was mm -hmm. had you already gained weight at that point, or was it the side effect of the medication that was more the weight gain? You hear that story all the time too. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and I, you know, it, and it's funny because often the clinical trials say they're oh no, it doesn't cause weight gain, but clinical trials run what six weeks, something like that. Right, you know, sure. when you're on this medication for you know, months, six months, a year, two years. And sure enough, that is when I started to to put on some weight right after that. And, you know, I've talked to doctors that are like, oh yeah, pretty much anything that's a, a, a neurological drug, there's going to be a weight gain effect. And the, the side effects, obviously they they're certainly vary, but 
some of the profiles of the side effects of these drugs are crazy, right? I mean, you know, depression or, you know, weight gain or, or hormonal imbalances or, you know, it runs the gamut, right? If you're messing th with things in your brain, you're going to mess with other stuff along the way. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. One of our former clients and somebody I just met at the um, the conference in Las Vegas this week, Jen Winkler had epilepsy and she kind of described what it was like. Oh, yeah. And it's like you start out with one medication. When that fails, you switch medications. When that fails, you either switch or add a medication. And it's like mm -hmm. we could have started with something that's arguably way easier for little to no cost with very few side effects. And so maybe this would be a great time to tell that story. I mean, you hear things like, yes, we knew about this 100 years ago. You hear about ancient cultures. I, I can't even remember which one, but it was like ancient Rome or something where if you had seizures of a, a seizure or symptoms of a seizure or something, they would put you in like a dark cave for two or three days, essentially like intermittently fast you and you'd come out and be fine. Like you hear that we've known about this for a little while without really maybe knowing the, the mechanisms or whatever. Why is it that that ended up falling out of favor and, and people like, you know, Jim Ada, Abrams, excuse me, felt, you know, insane for coming across something that nobody was talking about anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and you're right. I mean, Hippocrates in, um, you know, the, the father of modern medicine, he wrote a book called the, the, um, um, what was it called? The divine disease anyway it, it, arguing that you know it wasn't evil spirits that are causing seizures but that it actually is a physical thing in the brain right mm -hmm. and he says in there fasting is an effective treatment right um there's a reference in the bible that that um you know the disciples are trying to cast the demons out of a of, out of a child who has is falling into the fire and then falls into convulsions and jesus says this type can only be healed by prayer and fasting so mm -hmm. fasting has been a part of the yeah it, you know it's kind of crazy so fasting has been part of the narrative for a very long time but of course how long can you fast right um so um and on and off again you know in the modern era uh, one of the more uh colorful characters i came across in the story was a guy named bernard mcfadden i don't know if you've ever heard of him um but he's so so he was a, a physical culturalist he called himself um around 1900 and um, this was kind of the first wave of um, fitness enthusiasm in the United States, you know, gym culture, if you will. Um, and it came from really from German uh, immigrants who had the, brought with them the gymnasium, right, or gymnasium, right? And they had this idea that, hey, exercise is good for you, which was kind of novel to us Americans at the time, apparently. Right. Um, <laughs> and so, and so he... Um, sort of went all in on this. He was a really interesting character. He believed in walking barefoot, even in the winter and the snow, you know, he would pull his hair every day to try to make it thicker and longer, you know. Um, and he he uh, started a whole chain of gyms nationwide, a whole chain of uh, health food restaurants, uh, started a publication, which was sort of, um, I guess if you, if the Oprah magazine was made by a, by a gym bro, it was sort of that, it was like f pictures of him flexing and working out. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> but it was super popular. I mean, he was actually like a really wealthy guy. Um, and one of the things that among his ideas was fasting was a big thing. Like, you know, for everything from, you know, stub toe to, to epilepsy, which he mentioned. Right. Um, and one of his students uh, was a doctor named uh, Hugh Conklin, who was a, a DO, doctor of osteopathy um, and was interested in, you know, natural cures and things like that. So, so, uh, Conklin was actually the first person to publish in the literature about fasting as a treatment for epilepsy in the medical literature. Um, and he had, I think he had about 30 subjects in his, in his clinical practice. So it was sort of case, case series kind of deal. Um, and talked about how effective it was in children and, and about 50, 60% of, of adults, you know, responded to the diet. Um, and so there was, so again, you know, fasting was in there for a long time, but it wasn't until uh, 1921 um, that they were able to kind of start to explore why there was this connection between fasting and, and seizure control. And it was with the discovery of ketones in the urine, right? Um, there wasn't a whole lot of testing they could do back then, right? But one thing they figured out, they can test for ketones in the urine. Um, and that was when... Um, a doctor at the Mayo Clinic figured out that, oh, a high fat diet will produce these ketones just like fasting will. And so that was the first, 1921 was the first publication of the 
ketogenic diet, right? Um, and he was what named it. And at the time, it was um, the protocol, and it's still used today. They call it the classical ketogenic diet. Was a four to one ratio. They talk about it in ratios. So for every four ounces of fat, you have one ounce of protein and carbohydrates combined. Mm. So it ends up being like a by macros, it ended up being like ninety percent fat, basically. Um, and so that you know. It, it was published about, it was talked about, it became sort of standard practice. Um, right up until the mid 50s, I think it's 56, that uh, phenytoin, the first um, effective uh, seizure drug was was put on the market. Um, and sort of, I talked to uh, Dr. Eric Kossoff at, at Johns Hopkins about this, like, is it a conspiracy? Was it the drug companies trying to keep it down and, and those kinds of things? And he said, you know, really the ketogenic diet is a fly on the back of big pharma, big pharma, you know, it's, you know, um, it, he doesn't really believe it was a conspiracy, but just the sort of general movement in all of medicine toward pills, you know, or toward uh, prescription based medicine. Um, and so over the years, there were, you know, there's been research, there's about 26 different uh, medications for epilepsy now. But none of them is actually more effective than the ketogenic diet. In, in controlling seizures. That's the crazy thing. Like they, they've gotten better. They've gotten fewer side effects. They've gotten, you know, better um, time release administration, all those kinds of things. Right. But really that with the ketogenic diet, you know, if you look at the meta analyses of I think 70, 80 studies have been done by now over the years. Um, it's about a third of patients can, uh, are able to achieve total seizure freedom about a third have a reduction of 50% or greater in seizures and about a third there's little to no effect at all and but again that they're still doing just as well as any drug out there and like you said if there's something you can do that's natural that has no side effects that doesn't have all these chemicals crazy chemicals to it why wouldn't you try it you know yeah that's very uh, well explained thanks thanks yeah yeah and so you know i, I it is kind of frustrating to me in a way that it does still considered fringe um and again going back to jim abrams he talks about this all the time uh, on their website they have a map of how many diet epilepsy centers are in each state and i think the highest number is maybe four or five in california all of california right uh, but in many of them it's zero in about half of america there's no access to this treatment wow. right um so it's it's kind of wild, and 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 you know, I, so I was just talking to a friend who has epilepsy as well, and as you mentioned, like he's been on Depakote for forever, right? Um, and that's one of the older medications, and it's got side effects. So now he's got they add this medication to to deal with the depression that comes from the Depakote, and then they add this medication that has to has to do with the side effects of that medication. It's just this this stacking effect right yeah. um until you're on just like this chemical mess of chemicals of of you know just to try to get through the day you know it's crazy that's crazy well you mentioned gary taubes and i am in the middle of his newest book uh rethinking diabetes I'm about halfway through and you he, he's telling that story and he's told that story in in several of his book he's like you he's a great writer and and basically like it's kind of along those lines of that type of a story. It's not that anybody conspired to do this. It's that you had a group of people that had to change their diets. They had to be compliant to this diet, or you could eat what normal people eat and take insulin, which we had just discovered at the time. Why not do that? That sounds way better. And nobody had studied long-term effects of giving somebody insulin because they were just starting to do it. So what's, what's the harm? These guys now can eat cake and pie and everything else that everybody else can eat. And it just kind of progress that way to the point that, yeah, chemical mess is a good way to describe it where you got medications on medications on medications to deal with all the side effects that the original thing tried to treat. So yeah, was it, was it this evil thing that happened? Of course yeah. there were bad decisions made and we you know, right. didn't follow the science closely enough, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like you, I don't really necessarily believe it was like conspiracy per se. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, even if you look back at um, the food, uh, um, and as I've gotten into this, I've gotten inter interested in the food system and, and, you know, all these things. And, you know, if you think about the 50s, it's when they're coming up with Jello and and all these sort of miraculous, you know, science. It's like miracle of modern science, kind of Crisco and things like that, you know, that are that are made in the lab. And, oh, of course, it's good. It's new, right? It's, it's, it's there's sort of that 
um, modernist thinking around that, right? Um, you could see how maybe it was just swept up in that and in, in this medical community as well. That's right. Know? Right. And and to be fair, like there were problems with the dairy industries and cities and things like that. Like there, there were some right. things going on that that actually addressed. So yeah, again, interesting to, to follow that. Let's talk about the science itself and what you've learned about ketones and keto, you know, the, you know, yeah, a ketogenic diet. What is it about a ketogenic diet that can help most people in, in the realm of like mental disorders, including epilepsy? Yeah. Thanks. Great question. Um, and again, as you mentioned, master of fine arts and creative writing. So not a scientist, nothing medical advice, you know, <laughs> for the folks out there. But um, but I've got I have gotten really, really fascinated in this. In fact, I just went um to the uh metabolic health summit, uh, which happened in Clearwater a couple of months ago. And just it's there's so much excitement in the air. I've been to so I, I work in the academic community, I've been to lots of conferences in my own field of English. But this one was just, uh, it hits different, you know, you, there's this a sense among everybody there that, hey, we're on the cusp of this amazing thing. We're on the cutting edge of this science and, and it's just life changing stuff, you know. And so um, the, the most recent book I read um, and, and was just, you know, writing about for my blog, a little summary of it was um, uh, Chris Palmer's book, uh, Brain Energy. I don't know if you've seen that one. So but, good, so good. <clears throat> Oh, it's so great. And, and he describes sort of what, you know, he starts with, okay, why is it that so many epilepsy medications are also used to treat depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, all these different, you know, we, we, we sort of compartmentalize, right? We say neurology is over here, psychiatry is over there, right? It's the same organ, we know that, but, but clearly they have nothing to do with each other, right? <laughs> so over here we're talking about you know the chemicals and then the, the neurotransmitters and things like that and neurology but over here in psychiatry we're talking about you know adverse childhood experiences and stuff like that um and he says well what if it is all connected right what if it really is just about uh, mitochondrial function in the brain which is basically how the brain makes energy right um so on the you know in my book, I, I really focused mostly on epilepsy, but I did put a couple of chapters about the future of the ketogenic diet and how it's being now explored, just like it has, you know, these applications in um, in epilepsy. But now also they're looking at um, they're looking at Alzheimer's, you know, they're looking at dementia, all these things. And with people like Dr. Palmer are looking at its application and things like uh, schizophrenia and depression, bipolar, you know. Um, so it's really exciting time. And and the funny thing is, you know, we don't know exactly how it works. There's sort of a number of possible mechanisms. So, for example, um, inflammation. We know that the ketogenic diet will lead to less inflammation throughout the body, but that, but also definitely in the brain. Um, so that probably plays a role. Uh, we know that um, um, the gut microbiome is a big thing. So you know, if you're on a ketogenic diet, the, the gut microbiome changes the, the composition of which, you know, which bugs are down there and everything. And um, <clears throat> there's some interesting um, research that was at that conference where they took, um, this is kind of gross, but fecal transplants from, um, from mice uh, who were, you know, again, they had mice with epilepsy, basically put some on a ketogenic diet, they responded, had the control group, they did fecal transplants where they're taking the microbiome from one mouse and putting it into the other and they're seeing seizure control even without using the diet so you know there's certainly a lot of things going on there um when i started on it my my the, the sort of base level my doctor was like well the brain really loves ketones right if you have uh, there's a push uh, a push and a pull sort of thing so if the if the brain needs energy it will pull glucose out of the bloodstream right but if there's ketones in the bloodstream, they will push into the brain, right? Rather than the brain having to look for that energy and pull it up. So that, so your brain is actually functioning better. It has more energy available. Um, and that en that fuel, she said, she called it less excitatory. And that kind of has to do with um, the neurotransmitters, things like GABA, which are, they call inhibitory uh, uh, neurotransmitter, and uh, glutamine, which is excitatory. So too much of one, too little of another. You're going to have overexcitement in the brain. Basically, it's the the neurons are going to start over, you know overfiring and get out of control. Um, and so the ketogenic diet seems to keep those in balance better than um, using glucose as a fuel. Um, 
hope that made made sense. That was perfect. Rambling, but... No, that was perfect. <laughs> no, I, I really appreciate that. And yeah, like we can talk to, you know, researchers and experts in this field to explain it, but I, I almost appreciate it more when it's coming from somebody who had to go out and learn about it and make it make sense. So I really do um, appreciate that. I want to go back to your story and this, this kind of interesting moment where you're discovering a diet for a totally different reason. It looks like it mm-hmm. might be able to help with weight loss. You hear this episode that they are talking about the ketogenic diet for epilepsy. What what is that moment like? Like the, you can eat different versions of a ketogenic diet, but it's in the same like ballpark. Could it possibly be that one diet that is helping you lose weight could also help you with better control of seizures? Like that's pretty incredible. What was that like? Oh, my mind was totally blown, uh, honestly. <laughs> And, 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 you know, and the other thing is, again, Jim Abrams is, is such a passionate guy. I mean, he was literally crying at one point in the interview, just remembering everything they had to go through. Right. And it is, I mean, that's one thing about epilepsy is that it's really difficult, not just on you, but on your family. Right. My parents worry about me all the time. My wife is worrying about me all the time, you know? Um, And it's sort of this thing where, where there's a, I don't know. There's a, there's a mystery to it. There's a, there's a randomness to it almost. Right. Like, you know, I, I, I heard one person describe it once as having a stalker, like, you know, they're out there. You don't know when they're going to show up. Right. Are they hiding around the next bush or are you not going to see them for, for a couple of days or weeks? So, okay. um, and so, you know, so yeah. So hearing that this, this thing, right. That I've been sort of, dealing with uh, way over here in this little corner of my life and, and trying not to think about, right. But that it actually could be connected to what I'm doing over here and trying to you know, get in shape and lose weight and stuff. It's just like, Whoa, wait a minute. What? You know, wait, <laughs> I thought the body was here and the brain was there. Right. How is it that the, that it's all the same thing, you know, um, makes total sense when you think about it, of course. Right. But um, of course, everything's going to be connected. And so, yeah, it's just really, really eye opening opening moment to me yeah it's amazing and then just all the other pieces that come together like you you start studying evolution and then it makes even more sense and you start right. studying agriculture and like how how the planet works and transportation oh this is actually better for the planet if we do this the correct way there's yeah. so many layers to it that you 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 peel back i guess when you're first learning about it it just makes it so fascinating and we do know that there is somewhat of a difference between the, the type of ketogenic diet we would recommend for somebody with mental health treatments um right Versus somebody who is just trying to lose weight. Can you describe what the differences were for you personally? Yeah, yeah. Great question. Because I mentioned the classical ketogenic diet, which is sort of the most, I guess, extreme or the most, you know, in fact, um, and most difficult, of course, because you're weighing and measuring every single thing. Uh, But over the years, uh, there's been research about different sort of versions of even within the epilepsy realm, right? Um, everything from so so the the three to one the four to one ratio that i described then they tried a three to one ratio and that seemed to work for most folks um there's a version called the mct oil diet which liberalizes carbs quite a bit but you're taking lots of mct oil because they've found that if you take mct oil it goes sort of directly to the liver is converted to ketones quickly and so you'll be in ketosis even if you're not necessarily following those macros um the version that i'm on is called the modified atkins diet um, and that's what they usually use these days with adults because it's um, uh, so it's about 65 percent fat by by calories, right? 65 percent fat, um, about 25 percent uh, uh, protein, and then you know five to 10 percent carbs. So uh, basically, the instructions are try to keep your car- net carbs under 20 grams per day, and then sort of you know make sure you're getting enough protein, but you know. Um, they actually, they encourage you to track at the beginning so you can kind of see what it looks like. If I have, you know, chicken thighs and, and broccoli sauteed in olive oil, what do those macros work out to be? And that's right, pretty much dead on with the, with the uh, modified Atkins proportions. But then after you kind of get the, the hang of it, you can kind of move away from tracking every single morsel, you know, um, and so that's 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 the protocol in, in adults. So use modified Atkins. If it doesn't work, you might go through something a little more strict, you know. Um, but um, um, 
why they call it the modified Atkins is basically they took the Atkins book and it's basically the induction phase of the Atkins diet. Just stay in that phase, right? Um, so there is some overlap to, to your question. There is some overlap between the ketogenic diet for weight loss for, versus for epilepsy. You know, um, it's just with with epilepsy, the stakes are higher, right? The the, the why is a little bit bigger, and so you're going to be um, a little bit more. Um, purposeful about dialing it in as much as you can yeah 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 Yeah. yeah. we had nicole laurent come on our show um a few times but like to say like this will help you lose weight this will help you lose fat like that's awesome that's really great but once you start to get into the mental health this is the like okay now we're not screwing around anymore kind of a ketogenic diet we're going to be really a lot more precise like you said and it's cool that you can kind of start out a little bit more liberal and just know that okay if this isn't working you can always go a little bit more strict a little bit more strict the thing i hear a lot of mostly with kids some adults but mostly with kids is compliance they have a really 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 tough time keeping kids on the diet yeah they can control things at home but if the kids go to a party and they have a piece of cake and they go Mm -hmm. off what what has been first of all your own personal experience again kind of different since yours was diagnosed a lot later i would guess your motivation and your you know agency to be able to control what you're eating played a big part in how you're able to eat um but but also what you've noticed in the epilepsy community, like compliance, is that a big issue, or do you, do you tend to find a lot of people are very motivated to eat this way and they can they can continue eating this way for a very long time? Yeah, uh, great question. So so in the literature, and then the literature that is comes up again and again. Compliance is the biggest concern, right? Um, even in the clinical trials, it's among those who stuck to it. You know, these are the results, but you know, maybe almost sometimes almost half of the people that don't stick to it. And, and, you know, from my own perspective, it makes sense. I mean, you're doing something that is completely countercultural, right? I mean, especially, especially if you're on a stricter version, it's like, forget about eating out, you know, forget, even if you, you know, unless you really, really, you know, I'm going to have the hamburger bun with cheese and bacon and throw on some extra mayo to make sure I get enough fat and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, it's just, those you're making decisions every day that goes against the prevailing culture, right. And goes against what we're being told to eat. Right. And so I think that's another piece of the compliance. Like, you know, I will hear, Oh, sure. It's good for your brain, but it's going to kill your heart. Okay. A, that makes no sense. Right. Why would nature create a a being that one, one diet's good for your brain, but it's also bad for your heart. You know, when on the surface of it, that makes no sense at all. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I still struggle at times, you know, you go to a, go to a party and there's, you know, absolutely nothing there. And, um, you know, I guess I'm fasting tonight, but, you know, family things, some, something like that, you know, um, and so and so made her special such and such, you know, whatever it might be, right. Um, so it is, it's, it's, you have to be really dedicated i was going to say discipline but that goes without saying you have to be really dedicated to making this a part of your identity almost you know and just i think a lot of it is the mindset and you have to say well this isn't a treat this is just junk and you know this is carbohydrates are just cheap fillers you know and and it's you know beneath me you know you have to have almost uh robert saivez talks about that how vegans have you know to their credit they have this mindset that you know, this is who I am and this is what I do. And this is, you know, animal foods are, are, are murder. I disagree, but you know, are these terrible things, right? You almost have to think that way about carbohydrates, right? Yeah. Kind of make your identity. I like that. It's so coming back from this conference that I was just at the collaborative science conference in Las Vegas, uh, hosted by Dave Feldman. He's doing a lot of that research that you're mentioning about cholesterol. I kind of thought that would be like the main focus. And it certainly was. Everybody was there to learn about cholesterol. But I also noticed this other like subgroup that was like just just as much were there about mental health. And I didn't know mm. why I didn't like put it together after being there for like half a day before I realized like, oh yeah, okay. So these are the people who have to be on very strict ketogenic diets to deal with these, you know, severe mental disorders like bipolar and whatever. And when they do, yeah. then they get that cholesterol response. That's why they're so interested in all this cholesterol thing is because they're being told you can choose between having mental disorders or having your heart blow up. And we are not in right. a place where we can say definitively that that may or may may not happen. And so I'll just ask you on a personal level, all things considered, not just the weight loss, you know, the, how how you felt the the epilepsy, everything. If, if I said that, unfortunately 
the research that we're doing on cholesterol is not looking that good and you might have heart issues by eating this certain way does that change what you day to day what you do and what you eat day to day or do you accept the risk and continue living this way because of so many other benefits wow that's a great question I stole that from Dr. Baker. I stole this one from Dr. Baker. I know how I would answer and I know how many people in the room answer it when they get asked, but yeah, I'd love to hear yours. Yeah. Yeah. And so I go back to that incident where, where, um, you know, that, that car accident where, where, thank God I made it through. And, you know, after that, I thought, okay, I'm on, I'm on bonus time, you know, like, like this is, you know, I could easily have died there and now it's, now I've, you know, sort of, well, my my admin assistant at the time was like, "God is saving you for something special," you know. And so it's so it's almost like this is kind of talking around your, your question, but but it, it's almost like okay, well, this thing could definitely kill me, right? This epilepsy thing, and there's something called SUDEP, which is sudden death in epilepsy, where you just start seizing and you can't stop seizing, right? Um, and and until you have perished, wow. basically, right? Wow. Um, and so that's a real danger and a real, um, um, uh, thought for, for anybody living with epilepsy. Right. And so if this diet is going to help me avoid that, but it may or may not, you know, cause this other problem with heart and, and, you know, the more, I, and so I, I do worry about it, I'd say, and I do try to learn about it as much as I can, you know, um, LDL and, and, and HDL and ratios, but I will say that, um, <laughs> this is I, I talk in stories you know but a, a year ago i was due for my annual blood work with my um, neurologist and so it was um right around the holidays once again right and my, my wife is from the philippines and they have a dish there called lechon belly which is uh grilled uh pork belly okay. right so the, the part of the part of the pig that they make bacon out of it's just a steak of that right <laughs> So it's massively fatty and it's got the skin still on it and the skin gets nice and crispy and you, you chop it. Oh, it's so good. It and then so good. with lemongrass and spices and stuff. Um, so this is like, this is what they do for holidays and celebrations and things like that. So it's New Year's Eve. I said, oh, I'm going to make a lechon belly. I got one from, um, from this butcher and okay, we'll put it together. And it was like a five pound, it's like a five pound thing. And it's just my wife and I, right? So New Year's Eve, lechon belly for dinner. New Year's Day, lechon belly for breakfast with eggs. <laughs> New Year's night, lechon belly again. So it was basically three days of eating nothing but pig fat. <laughs> and then the next day I got my cholesterol done. <laughs> okay. LDL 120. A little high, but not bad. Um, HDL 95. And triglycerides 46. Pretty great. So my doctor's like, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Pretty great. <laughs> this is this is like perfect. Wow. So okay. Yeah. Maybe I'm not so worried about this this cholesterol stuff after all. That's know? excellent. Yeah. And if you understand the lipid energy model that Dave is proposing, those numbers would be very predictable. If you had eaten a lot of fat yeah. in the days before a cholesterol test. I would assume that your LDL cholesterol would not be super high because you're delivering fat through the lymphatic kind of system versus delivering it through VLDL and LDL particles. And so that makes a lot of sense. If you ever want to fl pass a cholesterol test with flying colors, just eat tons of fat in the days before you go and you'll be fine. That's fantastic. Exactly. That, that, and that yeah. sounds amazing. You're going to have to make that for me one day for sure. I did a pork belly yesterday. It came out way too dry. So you're my guy now. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I got you. I got you, man. Uh, <laughs> you already answered one of my favorite questions to ask, which is contrary contrast a low carbohydrate conference to another professional conference that you have been to ever. And I, I've made this argument before that I would submit that regardless of the topic, you get that group of people together, low carbohydrate people together talking about anything. I don't care what it is. I'll bet you, you feel a difference in the energy with, with how amazing people feel and, and all that stuff. That said, again, you've been to other conferences. T tell us the difference. What is it like to go to that type of a conference on your own dime, usually on a weekend where you're inside yep. all day, where you'd probably rather be on the beach. What is that experience like? Oh yeah. I mean, but, but like you said, the energy is incredible. And at this one, uh, so my father lives not far from there. And so I was staying with him, got to spend some family time, you know, drive 15 minutes away, you know, go to the conference, come back. Um, but, uh, the second night I had, uh, signed up for, they had a VIP dinner, you know, you could pay a little extra. Um, first of all, the food, 
amazing, right? <sighs> huge steak, huge piece of salmon, you know, this cauliflower mash. I was like, wow, I can eat everything here. <laughs> you know, usually you go to a conference and you look at the table and it's all a bunch of Danishes and right. crappy coffee. Amazing food, right? Um, people excited. And then they had, um, so they had a bunch of awards. They awarded um, Mary Newport, a Lifetime Achievement Award. It was really, and, and I've gotten to know her over the years. So it was just amazing to, to see that. Um, and they had a dance floor. And this is not too uncommon at academic conferences. Um, there's a there's an author, uh, Kenneth Robinson, who writes about education. And he says, you know, if you've ever been to the dance floor at an ac <laughs> academic conference, you call, you've had an out-of-body experience because there's a bunch of just people still standing there, swaying awkwardly, you know, looking at the watch. How soon can I get out of here? You know, wanting to go home so they could write a paper about it, you know. Um, and uh, this one, so they had their awards. They had the presentations like, okay, we're going to open the dance floor. Boom. Everybody just rushed onto the dance floor. It was like packed, you know, person to person everyone's just dancing going crazy you know uh, they finished the band finished at exactly 11 o'clock you could tell that that's when they were their contract ran out and all of a sudden people just shouted one more song <laughs> one more song <laughs> like you would never see that at an academic conference anywhere else you know wow. and so the, they didn't but the dj put on like one more song for us you know and the, it was just it, it was wild you know like i said just the energy there is just so it's awesome. palpable you know? so awesome. yeah wow and i was just reflecting too on this last one it, like if you, I'm, I'm sure that kind of concluded the entire conference but if you went the next day I, you probably would have noticed what i noticed people flew in there were tons of delays and cancellations and all this stuff and you look around the day after a bunch of people traveled in the afternoon after lunch it's three in the afternoon of very technical presentations everybody's chill everybody's just like paying attention oh, yeah. and alert and they are into it and there's nobody like nodding off or needing a nap like everybody just feels amazing <laughs> Right, right. Versus everybody. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, the so cool. typical everyone, the 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 afternoon slump, you know, yeah. I've presented at conference at conferences before. And, oh, I got the one o'clock spot. Oh, oh geez. Terrible. Everyone's going to be asleep in the audience, you know, but you're right. No, it's, it's here. Everyone or if they even ate lunch, you know, a lot of them are just fasting straight through and, and going to the lunchtime presentations, yeah. you know, and yeah. Yeah. Easy. Oh, that's awesome. Man, David, this has been awesome. I definitely think that you have a remarkable brain. I really appreciate all your work. And I, I love the way that not only do you cover the science and you explain it, but you do tie in the stories, which makes it really easy for people to understand. So I really appreciate that. Despite you not having a very long career in the NBA, I do appreciate the book and that you were able to come on our <laughs> show today. Please tell the listeners where they can go to find you, connect with you, and also to buy the book. Thanks, Casey. Um, unremarkablebrain.com is sort of my home on the internet. I do a newsletter every week where I just um, totally free, you know, uh, it's through Substack, if you know the Substack platform. Um, sometimes it's a review of a study that just came out. Sometimes it's a book that I just read. It's sort of my way of cutting loose and, and my creative outlet. It's really good, um, so that's by the, the way. I've been playing yeah. around with it all weekend. It's great. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah. And um, so that's, and, and there's links there to my book, but you can buy it on Amazon. Um, you know, indie books, wherever, wherever your books are sold. Um, My Unremarkable Brain is again, the title of it. Um, And then I do, I don't do a whole lot of social media, but I'm on, I'm on Instagram, um, Twitter, uh, uh, Facebook, all under the D as in David Robinson writes as a, as a verb, W-R-I-T-E-S. Perfect. So. Okay, that's awesome. We'll link to all of that. Like I said, David, thank you so very much for everything that you've been through and to be able to write the book and to communicate in a way that people can really appreciate and understand and make it funny and entertaining all at the same time is really wonderful. So thank you again for all of your hard work and thank you for coming on our show today. We really appreciate you. Yeah, thanks for everything, Casey. Absolutely, it's been an honor. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio. As always, thank you so very much for listening to Boundless Body Radio. Hosting this podcast is seriously one of the most meaningful and joyous parts of my life. Even after 600 episodes of our show, I still get nervous before every interview that I do. But it does just bring me such joy to share some of my favorite people, the people that have taught me so much over the years, and to invite them on and ask them questions, and then to share that with you, the listener, is a super cool experience. I hope you've enjoyed the content of the show so far this year. I tried to start the year off with a mix of new guests and returning guests, some that are 
are practically household names in the health and wellness space, and some inspiring people that may not be very well known now, but are certainly doing amazing work wherever they are. I'm just so grateful for all of our incredible guests. Remember that you can always go to our website to book a complimentary 30-minute session with us at myboundlessbody.com. On our homepage, one of the first things you'll see is a book now button where you can select a time to speak with us about your personal health and fitness plan. We don't have any set packages, products, supplements, or anything like that to sell you. People that do want to work with us simply pay for the time that they want, and that's about it. We've loved chatting with so many of you out there to bounce ideas off each other and try to offer any advice that we can. And seriously, as always, even if you book a spot just to say hello and introduce yourself, we absolutely love connecting with you, the listener, and our community. Be sure to check out our YouTube channel, which is also growing quite a bit, if you want to watch these full interviews and also shorter videos on more specific topics taken from these interviews as well. It's a fun way to interact with people who comment. We read and reply to every single YouTube comment we get, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and leave as many comments as you like. And of course, if you haven't already, please leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple. It is still the best way to make sure that the podcast gets out to more listeners. It only takes a moment to leave a review, and it's extremely meaningful to us. Cheers, and thank you again for listening to Boundless Body Radio.